Discord and podcast. Let everyone join. Give it a minute. All right. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore and Duende District. I'm Jessica from Greenlight Bookstore and we are excited to be co-hosting tonight's event celebrating Latinx youth political engagement along with fellow independent bookstore Duende District. Our featured speakers tonight are Linda Lopez, author of AOC, The Fearless Rise and Powerful Resonance of Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, and Natalia Sylvester, author of Running. And we're also happy to have with us in the audience tonight students from the National Hispanic Cultural Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the Latin American Youth Center in Washington, DC. So a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see and hear you. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees on the top of your Zoom screen. The exact location kind of depends on what kind of device you're using. You are welcome to post your thoughts and comments in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the authors and interact with fellow attendees. We have some questions for our authors that were submitted in advance by students from um, the National Hispanic Cultural Center and the Latin American Youth Center, but we'll also have the chance for you to submit questions live. So if you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by Linda or Natalia, please post that question in the Q&A module. You'll find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. So we'll be pulling questions from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. We are recording tonight's event, so look for the video on YouTube tomorrow. We'll be posting that and sharing it. And importantly, a note about books. If you find yourself inclined to purchase Running or AOC tonight, and for so many reasons, I think you will, you have a couple of options. If you're local to Brooklyn and you want to stop by Greenlight Bookstore, we do have them on our shelves and we'd be honored to sell them to you. But I'm going to recommend that you purchase them from Duende District's online bookshop. And I'm going to post the buy links in the chat in a moment to support their mission of creating bookstores by and for people of color. Buying a book is a great way to support the powerful messages of these authors, as well as the literary culture that bookstores can facilitate. So we recommend it and you won't be sorry if you have these books to take home with you. So to introduce our featured authors tonight, I'm excited to turn the stage over to my very dear friend and the founder of Duende District, Angela Spring. Angela and I kind of grew up in bookstores together. We met working in a Manhattan bookstore. And since then, we've both gotten married and had babies and started our own bookstores, but not necessarily in that order. But we still get together to talk about books and the book business. And she's one of the people who most consistently inspires me. So because in addition to creating Duende District stores as standalones, pop-ups, and partnerships in many places that need them, she serves on the board of the American Booksellers Association and has become a great voice advocating for greater diversity and racial justice in the bookselling industry. So tonight is the first time in years that we've had a chance to work together. And I'm grateful to her for conceiving of the idea of bringing together these two great authors and two great books in the spirit of celebrating Latinx youth political activism, a more exciting and timely idea than ever and one that we are so honored to support. So please join me in welcoming Angela Spring. Take it away. Oh my God, Jess, you make me cry. Oh, I love you. I love Jess. I love that we could do this. Um, it's it's bringing back all the good old times. Remember when we could leave the house? <laughs> like, it's bringing back those times. Um, bienvenidos todos. Thank you all for joining us tonight. As Jess said, I am Angela Maria Spring, the owner of Duende District, and we are a bookstore by and for people of color where all are welcome. We are here tonight for this amazing event in collaboration with Greenlight uh, to feature Linda Lopez and Natalia Sylvester. Uh, and I'd also really like to extend a special welcome to Duende's community partners, uh, the Latin American Youth Center in Washington, D.C., and the National Hispanic Cultural Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, they, we've been good friends and done things together over the, over the years, and this is really wonderful to be able to bring them in the virtual sphere for the first time. Uh, so we're going to, tonight we're going to hear from Linda and Natalia as they read and talk about their books with each other, and then as Jess said, we're at the end, we'll open it up to the audience for your questions. Uh, so it is my pleasure now to introduce Linda Lopez, editor of the new essay collection AOC, The Fearless Rise of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and Natalia Sylvester, author of the YA novel Running, as well as a contributor to AOC. Uh, Linda Lopez is an Emmy Award-winning journalist and anchor at WCBS News Radio 880 in New York. She has anchored and reported for ABC News and WCBS 
uh, TV, as well as anchoring newscasts for Fox 5 and My 9. A former contributor to Latina Magazine, Glamour and Glam Beleza Latina, Lopez lives in New York City. And Natalia Sylvester is the author of two novels for adults, Chasing the Sun and Everyone Knows You Go Home, which won the International Latino Book Award. Born in Lima, Peru, she grew up in Miami, Central Florida, and South Texas, and received a BFA from the University of Miami. Running is her YA debut, and she lives in Austin, Texas, and can also be found at nataliasylvester.com. So Linda and Natalia are just as fierce and talented as the women and girls they write about. The Duende community already knows about our abiding love for Natalia and her novels. Running is a new step for her and she absolutely nails it. I think I read this book in a single day, so wrapped up in the story of Mari, her heroine. She definitely reminded me how a young AOC might be. We all have the choice to be great, even when our circumstances are designed to keep us down. Both Linda and Natalia's books are powerful testaments to that idea. So please join me in welcoming Linda Lopez and Natalia Sylvester. Okay, now Angela made us cry. That's <laughs> that was such an emotional. Thank you for that. Thank you for that introduction. Yeah, thank you so much, Angela. Like I, um, I love the way that you brought together like everything that we're writing about because I think that's really what we're here for. It's like I think what inspired me so much about the story was just um, wanting to really like search deep down into the things that empower us and the things, the, the, what kind of power we already hold within us that we just need to be able to find. And we need to have the support in order to do that. So I'm, I love that we can um, come together today and, and with that common, um, you know, and the, to celebrate that together. Yeah, Natalia is such a brilliant writer. I'm so thrilled to be doing this with you. And I love that our inspiration for creating these things is, is so similar because Natalia talks so beautifully about um, sort of the inner world that creates your, you know, your attitude about how you can rise, how you can do the things you want in life, how you can, you know, win your fights and, and be the person you want to be. And it was super interesting to me to explore, you know, sort of the external world and different themes and forces that might be in play that are, that work against you sometimes when you want to do that. So Natalia writes so beautifully what that's like for a person and an individual and the struggle you have there. And I wanted to also, I wanted to look at that, but also look at the other forces out there that might bring those same struggles and those same challenges. So I was super excited to be able to get to do this. Thank you. Well, I, and I think a lot of what, like I know like, like what you mentioned in the introduction to AOC is that the really incredible thing about her is that she's brought to light all the ways that, um, that things like, uh, you know, uh, wealth and privilege and race and access to education and environmental justice, like all of these things really um, intersect and they're just, they're truly a part of the reality that we are, um, that we are working to want to improve and make more just. So I, I, I'm excited to talk to you about that. I know, thank you so much. I, it was super interesting to me to not just um, have everyone talk about this book, about AOC in this book, you know, her as political figure, or like she has these specific policies and everyone's just gonna cheer about them. Or it was important to me to not, you know, either do a biography or have something that was just a bunch of collection of fans of hers saying, mm -hmm. you know, she's great and we all agree. But to really look at all the things that go into, you know, us walking through the world in this Latina skin and mm -hmm. what it can entail. So, um, that's why Natalia, you never pick favorites. I want to say that right off the bat. All of, all of the chapters in the book are my favorite, but Natalia speaks to me in such a very particular way with the chapter that she wrote and the essay that she wrote. And I think I get to read some of it, for us, don't we? Um, it's 17 writers who all contributed to a different aspect of how AOC has impacted them or impacted um, the country on a greater scale as an elected leader. And so, I was so excited to have Natalia contribute because I had read her, you know, obviously I'm a fan of the brilliant writing, but I had uh, read her on this theme before on this topic of how our language is important to us as a community. And so in my chapter, like Natalia said, I talked a little bit about um, people who come from certain places and certain communities and how those struggles mean you might you, you will find it harder along your way. 
Um, and Natalia is, is completely different, which is what I love about the book. It's, you know, every chapter might not ring so personally with you, but there is def definitely a chapter in there for everybody. And this one, you know, touched me so much. She speaks about how her family made sure that they spoke Spanish in their household growing up even though she grew up in Miami and her whole world was English and school was English and TV was English, her mom and her dad were very insistent that at home it was only Spanish. And that even though that was the case, it turns out that like many of us Latinx Americans, her Spanish is not as great as she would like it to be. <laughs> it's not as strong as she would like it to be. And so she grew up feeling like this was somehow a flaw or a weakness. And when she first saw AOC speak, on TV in a Univision interview, doing her first Spanish interview on national TV, she saw the mistakes and she saw the sort of Spanglishy Spanish that we all speak sometimes. And so Natalia writes so beautifully about how her first instinct was to judge her or to compare and contrast and notice that, oh, she did this wrong and she should have done this right. But as you read through Natalia's chapter, she starts to talk about how she starts realizing that even our imperfect Spanish is this beautiful superpower. So that's a little bit of the part of her essay that I wanted to read. So it begins. As a working class woman of color, AOC's willingness to speak and embrace the language of the working class immigrant families she represents is game changing. It's arguably one of the main reasons she got elected. And now that she has power, she's changing our perception, not just of what a powerful Latina looks and sounds like, but of the people whose interests are being served in the White House. Estamos aquí por usted, she says in the Univision interview, speaking to the Bronx community and specifying that this included its undocumented residents. We are here for you. In July 2019, Yasmin Juarez, a Guatemalan asylum seeker whose 19-month-old daughter, Marie, died shortly before, shortly after being released from ICE custody testified in front of the House Oversight Subcommittee to denounce the cruelty and neglect she experienced while in detention. In Spanish, translated by an interpreter, Juarez told the subcommittee, the world should know what is happening to so many children inside these ICE detention facilities. Among the members of Congress who listened to and questioned Juarez was AOC. She opened her statement by speaking directly to Juarez and thanking her in Spanish for her bravery and sharing her story. She paused before continuing, clearly overcome with emotion. She briefly switched to English, uttering, I don't, then seemed to change her mind. Whatever Ocasio-Cortez meant to say in that moment, she couldn't bring herself to find the words. Instead, she cleared her throat and began her questioning. At times, she looked down at what were probably notes, carefully scripted sentences in Spanish. She spoke of policy and law, using phrases like requiere and mantengan to, to iterate that US law requires children held in ICE custody to be kept, kept safe and in sanitary conditions. Her tone was firm and clear, but it also carried a softness, a palpable compassion directed at a grieving mother as Ocasio-Cortez turned her statement into a question. In your opinion, were you and your baby here under safe and sanitary conditions? Su hija, su bebé, she said, home words, heart words. No, Juarez responded, no. There are those who'd say that AOC is giving voice to the voiceless, but I disagree. Undocumented immigrants and asylum seekers have a voice, but there are too many people unwilling to listen. Rather than speak for anyone, Ocasio-Cortez has, time and again, used her power and position to amplify their voices. She's taken up and held space so that others may join her in it. When, if ever, has a congressperson sat at that desk and spoken into the mic with imperfect first-gen immigrant working-class Spanish and listened to the untranslated words of a young Latina mother who sacrificed everything for a chance to better her child's life? It means something that a U.S. congresswoman and a Guatemalan asylum seeker could communicate on such a platform without the need for an interpreter. It's powerful to know that the pieces of ourselves too often lost in translation have an ally who will fight for them. And that is part of Natalia's chapter. I forgot to mention her chapters titled In No Uncertain Terms. And it's just part of the beauty <laughs> that you will see there. Natalia, I had seen you write before on this topic, on the topic of our imperfect Spanish. And 
it's not, you know, an unfamiliar subject. We talk about it all the time amongst first generation Latinx Americans, but I, I was saying this when I was discussing it with another one of our contributors, Patricia Reynoso, who said, I don't think I've ever seen someone write about it so clearly and beautifully as it was stated in the way that you put it in your chapter. What, where did you find that? How long did you have to think about that or struggle with that to come up with the words to express that feeling? Thank you. First of all, thanks for reading that. Um, and also just thank you for even just asking me to be part of this project because it has been such an honor. Uh, and, you know, a lot of what I wrote in the, there were a lot of parts of that essay that are things I've been thinking about for a really long time, but definitely just the process of you asking me to contribute to this essay and then having to work through that and piece them together. It was like discovering a whole other layer about them. Um, so I think what has always, uh, I don't even remember when this happened, but like, I know we're, a lot of us are familiar with this idea of feeling like our Spanish isn't good enough, right? Um, and what's surprising to me though often is for every time that I find myself unable to reach a certain word, like, like I, I talk about um, words like if they're shelves, you know, like sometimes um, it feels like Spanish words, it's not that I've forgotten them, they're just in these really high forgotten like shelves that I haven't accessed in a while, so it takes me longer to get to them than English would. Um, but at the same time, even though like all our lives, a lot of our lives are consumed and, and, and um, present in English, there are just as many times when I don't have the right words in English. And I realized that the amount, the amount of times when I reach automatically for Spanish, even when I'm speaking in English, it's always those home words and those heart words. And it might be something as simple as, like if you think about the way we talk about kitchen tools, you know, I don't actually say ladle. Um, I say, like, I'll be like, where's the cucharón? You know, <laughs> and I, or I won't say, um, I don't know, <laughs> I, I won't say luggage, I'll say maleta. And there are certain words that they're intimate. And it's because at home, this is the, the world we've created and, be, and it's had its own language. And there's something really tender to it. Um, and so in the process of writing this essay and thinking about AOC and how she seemed to bring this like, this language of um, just this really intimate language out in the open. It just felt incredibly powerful. Um, and it felt like a new way of being represented because I know a lot of us can feel like we're either, um, if we, you know, on the one hand, we, we often have immigrant parents or grandparents who have, will tell us about um, feeling like they, can, they don't fit quite in like here or there in their home countries and then here. But I do think that even the children of immigrants feel that way too in that, do we feel Latinx enough, right? Um, so I just, I think that's really where that came from. And, and, and to see the way that um, the AOC uses it in a way that wields political power, um, like brings it out of the home to then represent us in this deeply personal way is so incredible. Amazing. You know, I have to ask too, um, I, I had in my head, I knew who I would have as my list of my dream contributors to the book. And when I, at, every time I asked someone that I really hoped would say yes, I just would, you know, prepare myself for the disappointment and prepare myself for the no, but I was so thrilled when you agreed to do it. And I, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you for a while, why, what was it that inspired you to say yes? Why did you think you wanted to contribute? Oh my gosh. You know, it's funny. At first I was really nervous about it. Uh, <laughs> I think maybe that's why it took me a couple days because I was like, well, I have something worthy to say. Um, I think just a, uh, I was a little bit timid, <laughs> I think, um, like knowing of you and your work too and, and what you were, you know, all the other writers you'd also brought. I, I think a lot of us have like imposter syndrome at first. And then, um, but I also, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, when I really learned more about like, because I know you emailed me and you told me like what you were trying to do and um, and really kind of looking not just at, um, it made sense to me that like, that you were trying to, to bring these voices together about AOC and the way that she's, she's also, it's not just about policy, but it's a complete cultural shift. Um, and I, I just, I, I wanted to be a part of that. So thank you. And I actually wanted to ask you because this is a question that we had from Sara Peralta at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. Um, and I would love to know the answer too, actually, um, is that how did you choose the 17 writers featured in the book? 
speaking of? Um, let's see. I in my in my whole career so far as like a reporter and journalist, I've been super lucky to run into um, so many Latinas that I admire their powerful voices. And the book is is mostly women and mostly women of color, but I definitely want to shout out our couple of men <laughs> who are brilliant in this. Um, but I knew that I wanted to bring together a collection of people, women especially. Um, whose voices don't always get elevated together, especially in this arena, in this particular subject. And I just wanted to, like you said, it wasn't about one particular thing. It wasn't about a policy thing or, you know, sort of advocating for one thing, but taking note of the huge impact and resonance she had, you know, culturally and politically and, you know, on so many different specific communities. So uh, a lot of the contributors are people I know because I've run across them over the years. Carmen Rita Wong and I know each other from our TV days way, way back. She used to be an anchor on CNBC. Um, Patricia Reynoso, whose essay I also love because it touched my heart so much in, this, in a way similar to Natalia's. Um, she was the editor in chief at Glamour's magazine for Latinas for a very brief moment in time. Glamour uh, published a magazine called Glam Belleza Latina, which was an English language magazine, but directed to American Latinas. And um, she invited me to contribute to it a couple of times, which I did for a few articles. Um, so I was I was just familiar with her work, and and then a lot of the other people. Honestly, I was just fans. <laughs> like Natalia, I cold emailed them and said, "Will you will you please contribute to this book? I have this idea, and and do you think you might want to do this?" Um, so of course, Rebecca Traster, I was always a huge fan of hers. Natalia, a huge fan of hers. Andrea Gonzalez Ramirez, who's this. Um, Puerto Rican journalist who's doing God's work. She's doing some of just the most amazing investigative journalism having to do with the lives of, you know, Puerto Rican people, but also Latin ex Americans and, and women in particular. And um, I knew that if we needed a chapter that would sort of grab all the basics about AOC, you know, give the origin story to start off the book so you, you knew where we were going from there, you, you could have the context. I knew Andrea was a person who I wanted to have do it. Um, MC Gonzalez Noguera was Michelle Obama's communications director in the White House. She and I met at a Naleo conference <laughs> like randomly years ago during the Obama administration and strangely never forgot each other. And so when I, when I reached out to her, you know, it was like talking to an old friend and I knew she had um, both political insight but also personal insight and so people who had um, one or both of those um, connections to the subject is that people I knew would contribute really great and beautiful and strong, strong voiced pieces. So that's, that's the long winded answer <laughs> to your question. But I wanna talk about your other work too. I wanna to talk about running because it's so exciting that you're talking about this now that it's out in the world. So um, I know this is you know, one of the most basic of questions, but um, tell us about the title. Why did you decide to call it Running? Um, so yeah, so Running here, I'll show. Running is my debut YA novel. And it's about a young girl of mighty whose father's running for president, just as she's realizing that her own political beliefs don't actually align with this. And she has to kind of decide if she's going, like, what's she going to do with that? Is she going to speak up and when, at, the at this time when all this spotlight's on them? Is she going to um, join a movement essentially against his policies? And so, um, you know, the very first title I used for it, when I, I, I recently found all my files, and the first um, title I used for it was just called Run. Uh, and I think it was because I really liked the... Um, First, it's just a, there's like an urgency to it and there's like a nice play on the word like, yes, your father is running for president, but there's also a lot of things that at first Maddie finds herself running from uh, because she's actually really afraid. Like she's actually really afraid of using her voice and she's afraid of what it means to be speaking out against her father. Like I think so many of us have grown up with this idea of like, don't talk back to your father. Uh, and we internalize that and we internalize that silence, which then becomes a fear of speaking out. Um, so I also, looking back, love how the title ends up taking new meaning as the book progresses. Uh, somebody recently read a line to me towards the end of the book in which the word running is used. And by that point in Maddie's journey, it means something completely different. And so I won't say what, I won't say what, because I don't want to give it away. 
but it is fun to realize, to see how a title can mean different things throughout the different part of the book. That's amazing. I want to um, ask you a question too that we got from someone from Daniela Herrera Michaca. She asks, being from Peru, if you're Peruvian, how was the research process for a Cuban perspective for the mm. character in your book? Yeah, oh my gosh, that's such a great question. Um, so yeah, I was born in Peru. I came to the US when I was four and we initially moved to Miami. Then we moved to Central Florida, then to Mission, Texas, which is in the Valley here in Texas. And then we moved back to Miami. So I was in Miami from the time I was like in middle school till college. And I will say, I think, you know, I've, I've always been very much a part of the Latinx community because of the places that I lived. Um, and it's hard not to become immersed in the cultures of the places where you live. And so in Miami, it's like, there's a very large Cuban American community. In Texas, where I lived, there was, also, there was also a very large Mexican American community. And I've written from both, um, like characters who come from those, ex those uh, backgrounds in both this book and my last one. And I'll say that I never approached it, even though I did do research, I didn't think of it as research because so much of it really was just coming from life experiences of having those that you love and having the people in your community and then later your family. Like my husband is Cuban, is Cuban American. Um, like there are people in my extended family who maybe, you know how like you have family that's not by blood, but they're family. <laughs> um, you know, there are people in my family who are Cuban American and there is something about, um, I think that if you can a, have real community with someone and that there's a real foundation of trust, then that's how you know, not just what you do know, but you also know what you don't know. And I think that's so important, right? So I try to write from a place of honoring all the things we've shared, you know, conversations we've had over the years um, that aren't what we would call like your typical research, like maybe driving to a mall and having a conversation about our great, like our great grandparents and the struggles they faced and um, or even just, uh, you know, talking about our experiences over Sunday dinner, that's not really research, right? But it is something I pulled inspiration from because it are, there are things that always made me think about how similar our experiences were as being, um, as coming from immigrant families, but also realizing the vast differences and wanting to honor that. Um, so all that being said, I also, I also did, like, I, once I had the book, there were moments where I just, I don't think I would have felt right writing this if I, if I also didn't have people I could trust to ask about like authenticity. And so on the one hand, I actually had like sensitivity readers for this um, and not just for the Cuban American characters, but for example, for the Haitian American characters in my book. Um, but also there's just people like who I knew I could like send a quick text and ask about something. You know, be like, hey, does this sound right to you? And then be like, yeah, sure. Or maybe, the, you know, and I think, again, that's kind of going back to how, like, I think to really be speaking um, about any experience authentically, you have to have, you can't, the only access that you have can't be someone you paid to, like, check, like, fact check you. Like, it has to really be rooted in trust and community. And so really, that's where I was trying to come from, but also know, like, within the limits of like also know the limits of like, well, what are the things that I maybe shouldn't be writing about, right? Because there are certain cultural experiences for um, that I think a certain community, like that sometimes are very particular to a community. Sometimes maybe they're rooted in trauma. Sometimes maybe they're rooted in, in the particular ways that we felt very distinct kind of oppression. And so I think that you also have to know your limits in that and know like, okay, maybe I'm like, I, I'm writing this book from the perspective of of a Cuban American teen, um, you know, maybe it's not, it's not a book about like the very particular and specific experience of being a Cuban exile, for example, even though it plays into the history of her family, right? But it's not like a book about that. Um, so I also wanted to, um, to kind of also like allow that to expand the way we speak about our communities. Um, the way we see them as not just identified by the ways that we hurt, but also identified by all the other ways. Like the, in Miami, the Cuban community has an immense amount of um, political influence. And so that's something I need, I wanted to explore as someone who's been a constituent there, you know, as someone who is a constituent here in Texas um, with all, another Latinx and Cuban American Senator. Uh, so that was really interesting to me to see the ways that all our, um, that even though all our identities are not at all a monolith, 
um, there are so many places that they intersect. It actually makes me want to ask, because while you were talking, I thought about this. I um, years ago interviewed Lin-Manuel Miranda when he wrote the, of, of Hamilton fame, when he wrote his first musical In the Heights. Mm -hmm. And he plays a lead character in In the Heights that's Dominican, when Lin-Manuel is very famously Puerto Rican. And so I remember one of my first questions asking him, why did you make your character Dominican and not Puerto Rican? And he, he gave me the simplest of answers. He said, my wife is Dominican. Mm -hmm. And it made me, and, and I understood in that moment, I wanted to ask you if this was the case, that he was saying that when it's a community like that, that you feel close to, but that you're not, you know, actually a part of, but it's someone who's your family, who's that close to you, you actually have an affection for that community and that experience from the outside that's like a greater affection for it. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that was um, the case for you. Yeah, I did. I do. He wanted to write about it because of the affection he had for her and that community. Oh, absolutely. Like, I do. I mean, I've said this many times, but like, running to me feels like a love letter um, to, to like, not only the Latinx community, but also like the Cuban American community and even just all the other communities within it. Um, there's such a great amount of diversity in, in Miami in terms of like, you know, because we think of the community, the immigrant community as being like just this one thing and it's not. And um, Miami is just such an incredible, um, in incredible example of that. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, the funny thing is that even in writing it, like I, I, um, I like, I, it's not like my, my husband actually didn't read it during the writing because we don't like read each other's thing during the writing. Like we support each other's art by just being supportive of it, but not like actually. Um, but I, I think that there's such an insight and especially the way that family, um, that, that family works within Latinx communities, the closeness of it. Like if I say my in-laws, I know that in English, that sounds like a very um, distant word, um, but it's not, you know, like you, I don't, when I think of my in-laws, like they're my aunts and uncles and my, you know, like, and my uh, like, like cousins and sisters and brothers. And so there's definitely like, it's, it's absolutely rooted in love and it's rooted in, in people who trust you enough and love you enough to um, to tell you their stories without holding back. That's amazing. Um, I want to ask you one of the other questions that we got to. Let me see what we have here. Oh, there's a good question from Anne uh, Lechuga Canapili, who says, were there any points of the book that derailed from your original idea? So did you have an idea for this book, like in your head of what you wanted to be starting out, but then something ended up going completely a different way? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. I, it's hard to answer that without giving away spoilers, but I will say that there are a couple of people in the book who I originally thought were, would be like conflicting characters who were kind of working against Maddie, who's my main character. So I thought they'd be a little more antagonistic and in a way they became allies by the end. So I just, that was really surprising. And I think it mirrors sometimes the, the, the complexities and like the human, the complexities of who we are as people that, and that we can evolve and change as we're learning and growing. So, but yeah, so, and actually um, within that, I wanted to ask you and it, like talking about like controversial people because um, Anne Lachua Kanapi also asked um, why you feel AOC is controversial and why you feel, um, why do you think people look up to her as a role model? And I would love to know your thoughts on that. Um, why do I think she's controversial? I think that it's um, sort of a basic political stance that we have in our country that if you come out as a strong leader or a leader who gets a lot of attention, um, your opposition, your critics and your detractors, um, and I notice this, and I say this as someone who has reported the news and on politics for many, many years, especially if you are a Democrat, mm -hmm. your opponents will come out and sort of paint you as bad or dangerous you know this is not specific to AOC at all but they will um, there's a way that sort of creates a political drama and a political controversy that might be um, a little more created than it is real mm. so I think that you know just the way that our government and political parties and political interests work that's always at play to sort of you know that that makes the the wheel go round in that industry. But 
also I think because she decided to, as a very young, very new, passionate kind of leader, decided to stand up and say, this is what I'm going to fight for, and I'm not going to waver from that. And it's the kind of policies that in our government, we don't have a large contingent of voices standing up for and speaking up for at all. You know, she identifies as a democratic socialist in all of our senators, all of our hundreds of congressmen, all of, all of our government, we've got one. We've got Bernie Sanders. He's the only person who ever stood up and said, this is what I believe in. And I think that policies, policies should work more for working people than in the ways that we've done them. Um, she also says, I, I believe in change now, and I don't believe in sort of this, you know, slow grind of compromise that we do to take just um, little baby steps toward different mm -hmm. amounts of change. Um, I think that is something that helps people, you know, keep a, a very spirited and energetic conversation and debate going about her. Um, and, and again, I think she speaks for communities that don't always or very rarely have their voices elevated. Yeah. So she reminds people, you know, I am speaking for people from the Bronx. I am speaking for Latinos. I am speaking for people of color. I am speaking for all of the communities that she's speaking for. She makes sure to keep them front and center in her presentation of what she fights for. And I think it's just that you don't see a lot of that. And in really the highest echelons of our government, in the halls of power in this country nationally, um, you don't see it a lot. So. I think those are also such good reasons, by the way, like the kind of also answers the question of why she's such a great role model. Um, because it's the very reasons that make her controversial are what embody her power. Um, and I think those are things to look up to. So and it, it makes me sad that and I think it's far. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, and I think just to, just to echo what you were saying, I think as far as seeing someone who is the age that she is really stand in her power, you know, and not waver from that. I, it's much more rare than we think it is. You know what I mean? Especially when you're talking about a Latina woman who is willing to, you know, be bold and not waver and just be, you know, like we said, stand in her power. I think it's more unusual than we think it is. And so I think it takes people by surprise. Yeah. I agree. I think there's something to the way her anger is spoken about, and, and it's not even anger, it's just power, but it gets framed as anger um, that feels threatening to people because they just haven't seen it in that, at that, that level, um, which is actually- yeah, And that's cool. one of the things we wanted to explore in this book. We wanted to look into why certain perceptions, you know, get narrated the way they do. Mm -hmm. So I was- But also- no, I was, no gonna, I was gonna say that, um, that kind of reminded me of a passage I wanted to read from Running. Um, because yes. I was thinking of um, not only that, but just the way she uses social media, which I think um, is just so incredible and, um, and sharp and the impact that she has. When you even look just at the, you know, just even at a, at a numbers level of the amount of followers she has. Um, but really just more the way she uses it. It's like lightning quick. I love it so much. Um, so that kind of reminded me about a scene in Running that I wanted to share. Um, and it's so, you know, like I mentioned, Mani disagrees with her father on a lot of things. And there's this is from a scene in which she finds herself actually hiding from him in his office, in his campaign office, um, because they just had like a, an encounter that went really wrong. And um, Essentially, she's trying to hide from him in, her, in the closet, and she kind of, in a way, runs into him all over again. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that scene real quick. Um, wait, okay. So again, she's in a closet. <laughs> the air feels cold and fake in here. Every time I exhale, it hurts like a bruise I can't stop pressing down on. I take a few steps back, nearly tripping over an old paper shredder. But I manage to keep my balance by grasping at the wall. My hand lands on something smooth and slippery. It's a cardboard cutout of my father. He's wearing a charcoal gray suit, a red tie, and an American flag pin on his left collar. He smiles like he's holding his breath and waiting for the moment to pass. I lean into him on my tippy toes and take a selfie. I group text my friends 
what I just heard go down. BB and DDA both reply at the same time, I'm so sorry, Maddie. Zoe replies, that really sucks. He was never going to change, PC adds. And then finally, in all caps, Jackie, it's fine. They're scared. We got this. I stifle a laugh, and only then do I realize that there are tears in my eyes. They trickle down and hang from my chin like raindrops on an awning. I send them a selfie of me and my cardboard dad. This is about as real as he's ever going to get to me. Get with me, I write. Their flurry of approving emojis makes me smile again. I cut and paste the words into a tweet and attach the picture. I consider hashtagging it Ruiz to the future, but then I delete it. Delete, 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 delete. It's not worth it for now. The tweet would spread like wildfire, but in the end, it'd only be me that got burned. Even Mani wouldn't defend me. She'd say I pushed her to her limits, and I can almost see my little brother's face com confused expression when he'd ask, don't you love Bappy anymore? How do you explain this to an eight-year-old? That you can love someone but lose faith, that you can find things to believe in that are beyond him. The thumbnail of the picture implodes on itself as I delete it. It's still, it's better this way. I'm still angry, angrier than I've ever been. But Jackie's right, we've got this. Maybe not in the next few days, maybe not right away. It's like Bappy always says, important decisions take time and preparation. It's why he took so long to tell me my brother, me and my brother he'd run for president. I finally get it. Besides, my anger is too powerful to waste on hurting him. My anger is powerful enough for change. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's amazing. You know, I, I have to ask you, what made you want to write about a presidential run, about all of those things? Like when you're talking about the tweets and the cutouts, it's so vivid and real. Why was that the subject you wanted to take on for this? It's actually because I, I was, um, during the 2016 election, I was having breakfast and they were, there was coverage on the news of a candidate who was, you know, doing, giving a speech and standing behind him in the background was his daughter. And I just couldn't stop looking at her. And I just kept wondering, like, what must she be going through? And I couldn't make out her face. I was just kind of like, is that pride? Is it disappointment? Is it like, and, and you know, and, and just all these like conflicting emotions that I just imagined must be going on. And so it really brought to life this character to me of like, what happens when you're standing, literally standing behind your father in this very public way, but inside you're just completely conflicted and completely not in agreement with him. And you have to um, kind of shed that internalized, um, you know, idea of what it means to be a good daughter and, um, and, and choose like, well, but I believe this, this is what, this is the world I want to see. And so you have to decide what will you do about it. Um, so that's really where that came from. It was very much like a voice driven book from the very beginning and then the plot ended up being something I had to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's amazing. I think that's fantastic to even just to, to note that about someone who's in the background and to find that the interesting aspect of it. I, I think that's fascinating. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, should we see if there's any questions in the, um, in the chat? Yes, that would be great. We've got questions. We, uh, we got lots of, I love, I love a Latinx event. We're not shy with the questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's see. I, our, our first question is from um, Isabella Sanchez Castaneda. And she asks, I think this is for both of you, do any of the essays talk about the impact of AOC's visibility uh, that it has on young Latinas who are seeing what's possible through her? I'm sorry, I, I missed the last part of that. Oh, uh, what's possible through her, AOC's power, her political power? Yeah, we actually, um, it, we explored all the themes of what's possible from all aspects of who she is as a person and what her life has been up until this point. I, I talk a little bit about the neighborhood that she's from and the district that she's from, because it happens to be my neighborhood that I grew up in, I was born and raised in. So, you know, just sort of blocks away from where 
she lives now and where her district office is. And, um, you know, we, ex we just talked a little bit in there about how, you know, coming from some certain places, it's almost a miracle if you succeed in a way that you truly su want to succeed. So um, we talk about that. I think I mentioned earlier, Patricia Reynoso wrote a really beautiful essay about how she got to be the person that she wanted in the magazine world. She, you know, was a writer first and then an editor. She got to Helma Magazine. She got to all those places. And along the way, she saw other Latinas, not very many, but other Latinas who were successful too, or that she got to interview or work with. And she would get excited to see them, but she'd always walk away with the feeling that they're not like me. They didn't come from the place that I come from. Patricia is from Washington Heights. Her dad was undocumented. She, you know, they grew up with very, very little means. And she wasn't able to complete college. She only completed two years of college before she started working and then started working in the spaces in magazines that she wanted to get to. And how, you know, how tough it was those first early years, especially when nobody around her was like her. And so just having that experience of nobody's doing this, I just have to figure it out and do it on my own and stand here and be strong is another um, experience that we, we explore in there too. And then there are a lot of people who talk about her political power and how she's unafraid to talk about race. Erin Kaplan, Erin Aubrey Kaplan writes a beautiful and strong article on how it actually takes courage to even talk about race and color when you're talking about our politics or our national policies. And we happen to be in a moment now where we are having that conversation as a country, but it's still, it requires um, pushing through and still being able to have that conversation. And then we even have someone, one of our, our men who I, I so rarely talk about our men and I'm gonna change that. Um, one of our <laughs> men talks about why she decides to call herself a, a democratic socialist and the kind of meaning it has to her and why that means something different to millennials or to different communities than, um, than the definition that's painted by people who try to demonize her. So we actually try to cover all those aspects who make her who she is, but also show what the rise and what the building of her beliefs was like. So. Great. Well, okay, let's expand on that. This is for both of you from an anonymous attendee. Uh, can you talk more about that young Latina anger and how powerful it is because it shows up in both of your books? Um, I think it's something that so many of us feel from a really early age. And I found that out because part, well, not found that out, but one thing that really hit me was that when I was doing research for this book, one of the things that I did was I went back to my old journals. So I have journals from the time I was like six to to like being in my late twenties or something. Actually, I still journal, so really until now. But I found a journal entry from when I was like 12 years old. And it was like this whole rant talking about how upset I was about the gender and, um, dynamics in the households that I was a part of, like just throughout my family and um, you know in our communities, the ways that you see um, how so often it seemed like the women were like these very foundational rocks, but that whose work didn't get seen or acknowledged or even heard. And so our voices weren't being heard and our needs weren't being met. Um, and I wrote something like, this is the 90s. <laughs> Men and women are equal or something like that, I forget. Um, but it was just such a, it was a reminder I really needed to, to see about the ways that like, even though we are often told, at least in my experience, I was really told to be very calladita, tranquilita, you know, polite, always smile. And inside, I still had so much, um, not just anger, but like really strong opinions about the ways that things should be and, 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 the, and, the, and the way that things could be better. Um, and I think that the incredible thing that AFC is doing is really showing us that like, and, and I think not, and she's not the only one, but definitely in, in this very public way of saying like, you know, this isn't, um, our anger is not something to be dismissed. It's not even something to be written off as solely anger as if that were a bad thing because it's not, it's actually completely valid. And then she not only says that, but then we'll hold those to account. The, those who have been abusing their power and making things unjust. Um, and, you know, just such a perfect example was her speech after Representative Yoho called her, you know, like, you know, said those vulgarities about her. Um, 
the way she turned that into like, you know what, it's not even about your apology anymore. It's about how this is absolutely wrong and a decent man is not, you know, and what it really means to be a decent man and what are the things that women have had to deal with constantly while men rise to power and use that power, oh, excuse me. So um, I don't know if that answers the question, <laughs> but- um, It totally you have, <laughs> answers the question. <laughs> You know, it's funny because that, that theme is explored in the book because um, my hope for this book was to get, you know, people who maybe aren't part of these communities to understand the anger, you know, first of all, understand that it's there and then have a real understanding of why it's there. So, so many of these women put voice to it um, in, you know, in a much more eloquent way than I was able ever to do through reporting that I realized that it, it was almost a form of reporting it to the world. You know what I mean? Here, acknowledge all of these different experiences of all these different American women and understand that not only is it valid, not only are all the struggles they talk about real to this second and to this day, but that AOC tries to speak to them as well. And so maybe detractors should, you know, should sort of tilt their lens to see what they should be acknowledging because I, I believe in I believe in debate. I believe in like hearty, real debate and talking about what you know, debating ideas and talking about what's good and what's best to do, but understanding always where your opponent comes from. And I think that's that's like the little dream I had for this for creating this book, that that would be out there for somebody in the world. Awesome. Uh, all right, from the always wonderful Sara Gonzalez. Uh, she wants to know, has AOC read the book? <laughs> you know, we did not do it in conjunction with her or her team, um, because uh, again, we wanted more to be about the, the, you know, the impact and resonance that she's having. Um, I don't know if she's read the book. I do know that many, many awesome people uh, online, on social media, when I, when I first talked about it and when I first announced it, everybody tagged her. So <laughs> if we know she's prolific on social media, then I, I think she maybe does know about it, but we haven't um, heard from her if she has read it or not. All right. Um, from the also wonderful Tara. Hi, Tara. I did see your message. <laughs> um, Tara Ashra. Uh, she wants to know, kind of a crafty thing, how many drafts did you write of your books and how do you go through each draft and not get attached to certain parts and continue to make your book better and better? Gosh. Oh God, I don't know that I, I don't know that I, like sometimes I, I lose count. I will say probably for this book, anywhere between three or five, probably more five to six. Ooh. It's hard to keep track because they don't always happen linearly. Um, it's not like I just go, like I do write my first draft from front, you know, absolutely like just like, I, I, I need to get a first draft down. It needs to be something that like, it's kind of like climbing a mountain and don't look back, just get to the top kind of thing. Um, but then after I have that first draft, I will sometimes like revise in pieces and some revisions will be like much, um, you know, much deeper than others. And I say that I don't get attached because I do see it as a chance to make the book better. And I never see a draft as like a finish. I just see it as a process. And, um, and I very much work in layers. Like I only see my first draft, draft as a skeleton. So it's like, well, it's not a complete book yet. So each draft is just a chance to, um, to discover more about the characters, to make the story more rich and to make it more complete. What about you, Linda? Oh my gosh, I know for me, and, and thankfully, you know, I wrote a chapter of this book. Everyone contributed one chapter to this book. So I don't, I have such admiration for you because I don't know how I would get through a whole book because I, I also had this issue when I would write for magazines or contribute articles and stuff like that. Every word for me is exactly the word I wanted on the first draft, you know what I mean? <laughs> like that expression, kill your darlings, I have no ability to kill my darlings. Like someone has to kill it for me. So I, I went through, just on my chapter, I went through several drafts because I just had to get out what what I wanted to communicate, the idea that we were talking about before, why I thought um, this book should be done and be hopefully out in the world. And then I knew what I wanted to say around that. So, you know, that process of when I wrote something and I'm like, okay, that's exactly what I wanted to say. It was, it's a harder process for me 
again, I am not Natalia Sylvester, but it's a harder process for, for me to sort of take that and weave it the way that I want to so that it's true to its heart at the end of the day after all the other drafts, because I, I feel like in the first draft, what poured out of me, it was um, sort of the purest way I felt about it. All right. Um, another question from Isabella. Who are some of your favorite Latinx writers right now? I would love to know as well. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, you first, Natalia. Okay. Oh, cool. oh my gosh. It's so hard. Let's see. <laughs> it is really hard. Um, I am a huge fan of the Amdreveta's work. Uh, she has a new YA novel coming up in September called, um, is it Never Look Back? And uh, I just, everything she writes, I'll just like devour in like one or two days. Uh, <laughs> I really love Tori Maldonado's work and, and, and even just he as a person is just so wonderful and uh, like, yeah, like the most generous and kind human being ever. Uh, and uh, his work just tackles such complex and nuanced things about like what it means to be, um, it, it, like about, Latinidad and boyhood and also like Afro Latinidad and like and and um and what it means to be a black man, you know, in the US and a various age, like and growing up that way. Um and let's see, I'm also mm -hmm. um Chantal Acevedo, who recently also had a, a a middle grade novel come out. Um she's Cuban American and she wrote about uh a young girl who is who finds out she's actually one of the muses, like as in the Greek muses. Um so yeah, I just, there, there's so many, but I'll, I'll just stop there. <laughs> oh, and uh, you were cutting up a little bit for me. Did you say Elizabeth Acevedo? Oh, I said Chantel Acevedo, but also Elizabeth Acevedo. But also Elizabeth Acevedo, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who I would pick too. I'm like, oh, am I going to say everyone Natalia's going to say? Because also, other than Elizabeth, I have to say Natalia because, and Again, I am not saying this because you are here, but there's something about your writing, and this is gonna sound like a strange adjective, but it feels um, soft in the best way. Does that make any sense? It feels, um, there, there, there's no uh, cynicism in a bad way to it. And, and I just, just the way she sort of like, you know, constructs sentences and weaves language, like everything about it feels, um, soft and beautiful to me. I, I, it's a, I, I'm not describing it very eloquently, but um, I like that. And then Janine Capo Cruset. And um, again, not again, just because she's um, a contributor to the book, but just the, the strength of her voice and, you know, who, like, who she is being so present, just like you can feel it in the way when you read the sentences. So I would have to say all of those three ladies, but yeah, again, the, you know, you can't, you can't pick favors. <laughs> no, but yeah, no, Jeannie was wonderful too. And, and thank you for that. I, I actually, I think that's really, really, that means a lot, um, only because there are days when I don't feel soft at all. And I feel like actually really angry and, 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 and I don't mean to confuse that with there not being strength there and there not being oh. so much, um, substance. Oh, I don't, I, I'm talking yeah. about the, the feel that it gives to sort of read through the pages. Do you know what I mean? No. And I, I, I get that. And I just, I, I appreciate it a lot because like I said, I was just thinking like, there are days when I just feel like, gosh, am I turning into like the parts of me that are only consumed by like um, the harder feelings and I don't only want to be hardened, you know, and I think that's something we all struggle with, especially at a time when we are constantly feeling disillusioned and feeling sad and feeling cynical, um, is that how do we preserve our hearts? How do we protect them? Yeah. And I think, you know how they say that you, you're you drawn to the things that you, that you want to be or that you wish you were more like? And I actually, I have that same feeling like, you know, am, am I too harsh and straightforward about this or about, the you know, the way I want to communicate this? And so I, I you know, I sort of look to your example mm -hmm. to be like, oh, there's a way to do it both ways. <laughs> Thank you. And so, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Okay, well, we are gonna have to end it on that note since it is now, uh, it's 6.30 for me, but it's 8.30 over on the East Coast. Um, and I'm gonna let Jess hop back on. <laughs>
Oh my gosh, I just want to say thank you so much to all of these amazing women. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Angela. It's been an honor to spend the hour with you. And I'm going to leave this with one more link in the chat to votolatino.org. Um, one great way to get involved as an activist is to get to the polls, get registered and vote. It's more important than ever. And it's easy to do. There's lots of organizations, but this one feels like a great one to highlight tonight. So you can check out votolatino.org and find out information about your, your polling district and everything else you need. Um, look for this recording on YouTube tomorrow and buy the books from Duende District or your own independent bookstore. And thank you so much, everyone, again. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Good night. <laughs>